So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to yet another series of the African Healthcare Network uh, Fireside Chats, Series 132. And uh, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Her name is Dr. Chloe Ballist Del Pierre, and uh, she is the International Development Director at the Donation and Transplantation Institute Foundation. She's also the Associate Professor of the University of Barcelona and the Hospital Clinic of Barcelona researcher. She's also the elected counselor for the European Society of Organ Transplantation since 2021 and a member of the Congress Scientific Committee for Athens 2023. She is in charge of the University of Barcelona International Master's Degree in Donation and Transplantation of Organs, Tissues and Cells, and a post-degree and degrees program, program lecturer and scientific researcher at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Barcelona since 2021. She's involved in the hospital clinic's organ donation management services since 2006 as an organ and tissue donors clinician and researcher. She has coordinated research projects related with living donation, including the European Living Donation and Public Health, the ULIDS from 2006 to 2009, the ELLIPSI from 2009 to 2011, and the FISS, the psychosocial impact of living donation process from 2011 to 2023. She's also been involved in training in the European Mediterranean Postgraduate Program on Organ Donation and Transplantation, the EMPODAT from 2013 to 2016, the CATLOD, which is the Knowledge Transfer and Leadership in Organ Donation from 2016 to 2018, the Odyssey, which is the Organ Donation Innovative Strategies for Southeast Asia from 2018 to 2020, and the Theodore, which is the Trans-European Educational initiative in organ donation and transplantation, and also with the Transplant uh, Society and the International Society of Nephrology sister programs in Philippines and Sri Lanka. In the DTI Foundation, she's responsible for the development, implementation, financial, quality control, dissemination, and sustainability actions in over 30 countries, and is intensively involved with the Chinese development of organ donation for transplantation since 2012, where she has trained over 3,500 professionals with different stakeholders. She's going to be talking to us tonight on understanding the basics of cadaveric donor transplantation, uh, transplantation donation and transplantations rather. And uh, again, it is a remarkable CV that you have, Madam, and it is a pleasure to be hosting you tonight for this chat. So thank you for taking your time out and being with us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. It is my great pleasure to be with all of you today because uh, as we were discussing just before, this is a new activity for Africa in general. And then uh, I'm more than happy to 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 uh, to introduce you in this activity uh, through this uh, webinar. So first of all, um, to see in the global perspective of, of this activity, uh, in this moment, in 2021 are the, the last data, um, we are transplanting around 144,000 solid organs in the world. But those are only the 10% of the global needs. And many of the organs that are transplanted are from uh, living donors. And here we are going to to talk about the deceased donation. If you look uh, here on this map, you can see the transplantation activity with the different uh, colors. And unfortunately, as you can see, uh, Africa is still very gray, gray or with light colors. But if you look at the deceased donation map, this is even, let's say, uh, lighter no, <laughs> in the colors or grayer. So that means that... Uh, in Africa, there's almost no disease donation except for South Africa and for some areas in uh, North Africa, in Maghreb uh, region. So here you can see the deceased organ donation rates in 2022. As you can see, Spain is leading uh, together with the United States. And then comes uh, different uh, European countries that have taken the Spanish model as a reference. I'm going to try to explain you how does it work. In this image also, what you can see is that um, the, the rate of disease donation is not directly um, related with the index of development of a country. In fact, you can see countries like, um, like Japan that are really behind or Germany 
that is uh, also uh, not doing so good. And those countries are reference for many other um, fields in, 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 in healthcare. But e despite of that, we have other countries like in, in Europe, no? like Portugal, uh, Czech Republic, Slovenia, that are country, or, or Spain, that are countries that are not so well known in the field of, of medicine. So uh, I'm going to try also to explain you why. When we talk about the source of, uh, of, of organs, as I was mentioning before, you can see that um, these sources can be different. No? Here in, 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 in green, you can see living donations. So in Spain, this is a very reduced number of living donors, mainly, mainly for young recipients. And in liver, we have almost, uh, we, we have almost stopped uh, liver living donation in Spain. Uh, then it's very similar, the number of uh, DBD, so donors after brain death and the donors after cardiac death in red. In USA, you can see that the number of living donation is uh, a little bit higher and they have li li uh, least DCDs. UK is also more living donations. But then when it comes to India, for instance, here you can see, and, and this happens in Turkey, in India, and in most of the, the other countries in where they have started doing transplantation, but they don't have disease donation or very, very few cases. Uh, here you have also some data from 2020 uh, on kidney transplantation in the different uh, WHO regions. So here uh, you can see that uh, America and Europe and West Pacific region, which is basically Australia and, uh, and New Zealand, they are the ones doing deceased donors no? in kidney transplantation. The rest is uh, living donation. And these data also from the WHO are quite interesting because, well, I've tried to 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 put it in in more clear in more clear here in in the in this uh, in this table. And here, what is a little bit uh, surprising is that the low income countries and the low middle income countries have increased. The no, and the, the same with the upper middle income countries, they have increased in all of them the dialysis uh, activity, but kidney transplantation has remained the same or even decreased in the kind in the in the um, in the in the case of low middle income countries. So I think that this is a very slow progress in transplantation. And as you, the nephrologists might know uh, in the in in these uh, audience, transplantation and dialysis should not compete; they should go together. And in fact, uh, it, it, we have to think about these two activities uh, together. And this is a matter of fact that it's not really working very much. And what does the WHO says about uh, this um, field of of transplantation? So. Basically, what is really important is the fact of taking care of the donors. So donors have to be voluntary, non-remunerated donation is um, what the WHO is, uh, is always uh, counseling on, on that. They should be autonomous, free and, and have informed decisions. We need to protect the vulnerable persons and it has to be anonymized. No? Privacy should be um, ensured by the countries. Another important point is about optimizing the risk benefit of, of the activity. So that means that we need to make sure that there is safety, surveillance, and reporting system. So if there's any problem in any of the procedures, this should be reported to a national competent authority. And then comes the very other very important point about equitable access to organ transplantation. So any country should try to make sure that any patient that needs transplantation should be able to get that. So I'm sure that for many of you, a smile would come in your faces because this is easy to say, but it's not easy to, to, to put in practice. 
So um, when one of the last WHO global consultation on, on this field, they were putting stress on this idea of self-sufficiency. That means that every country should make sure that with their own resources of organs, they should be able to transplant their people, but putting stress also on the prevention of, of, um, of, of the chronic diseases and uh, their progression to, uh, to the stage of organ failure. So that means that we should have, every country should also have program for uh, kidney disease prevention, for instance. And then, and then, of course, to increase the number of organs coming from deceased donation. And it is specifically said that deceased donation uh, should, should be implemented in the countries. And why? Why? Because, well, the problem is that in, when in a country there is no enough organs to be transplanted, unfortunately, these recipients uh, will try to find a way how to do it. And here comes the reality of the world. And the reality is that not everybody has the same uh, income status, the same socioeconomical status. And that's why uh, the WHO, and in this case, this is, a, this is a, a, a presentation from the Council of Europe, we are worried about that because those kind of, 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 of things happens. So we have the typical donor and the typical recipient. And if there is no self-sufficiency in the countries, this might continue working like that. So that means that this is uh, an, an old um, an old data because you can see that China is here and now China is not anymore as a donor country because it is forbidden in China to transplant uh, any patient coming from outside the country. But in many other countries, this is not the case. So there is a tourism of transplantation and this could be changed by having donors in each country. So every year there are around 70,000 uh, kidney transplantations, 20,000 comes from living donors and at least the half of them comes from trafficked donors, okay? We can come into what trafficked uh, donors means, but it means um, it, it includes uh, the, the tourism of transplantation, it includes trading with organs, and it includes really trafficking with, uh, with, uh, trans with, with organ donors. So um, that's why many um, different uh, institutions, including WHO, but also the Transplantation Society, and then uh, national competent authorities like the Spanish one, that is like the, the, the model on, on this issue, um, did these, uh, these uh, editorial um, uh, article in the Lancet talking about this self-sufficiency. And self-sufficiency uh, means exactly that, equita uh, equitably meeting the transplantation needs of a given population using resources from, from within that population. There are some, uh, in this moment, some people uh, that are saying that self-sufficiency doesn't really make sense while we are not doing self-sufficiency in many other things like drugs or other diseases, other fields in medicine. But um, we have to take into consideration that the problem here is that we are talking about donors that voluntarily donate their organs after their death. And if we open the market for other people to come to this country, the society of this country will not um, benefit from these organs. So it is more complex than, than, than other fields of medicine. So we have to think about it properly. So doing some calculations, we believe that to get into this self-sufficiency means to convert 0,5% of the dead people in any country to convert them into donors. So we know that 1% of, uh, of, of the people who, who die are potential donors and only 50% of them can really become finally donors, utilized donors. 
So uh, here you can see uh, these calculations to see where is every country on on that uh, on that self sufficiency situation? And um, for the moment, only Spain and US are getting into it. But there are many countries that are working very hard on getting there and that are quite uh, nearby. So uh, once more, just to point out uh, what I was saying before, in Spain, what did it happen? We started the activity in uh, 1989. We didn't start having $50 per million population. We started um, lower. But here, uh, you, what you can see is that it was quite fast to get into $35 per million population, but then we got into a kind of plateau and we be, we thought that this was the roof and that we couldn't get more but because of we, of of what i'm going to i'm going to explain you that this activity is really run by professionals working on that daily we have found out the way how to expand the source of organs and uh, we before the covid almost reached 50 dollars per million population that uh, with COVID went down, but we are back to uh, where we were three years ago, almost so four years ago. Uh, of course, the more donors you have, the more transplants you are able to do and transplants from all the organs. And that's also the big difference with living donation in where you can only think about renal transplantation and hepatic transplantation. But in case of disease donation and both donors after brain death or donors after cardiac death, you can get all the organs to be transplanted. So Spain is one of the only countries that has more than 100 transplants per million population, which means that every citizen in Spain knows someone who has been transplanted. And this is also part of uh, the fact that we have such a big number of, of donors. Here you can see the patients that we have in our waiting list. So um, sorry, because uh, they come from the national government and they are in Spain, in Spanish, sorry. But here you can see that for kidney, we have uh, 4,000 people. And in 2021, so in total, we have uh, 400,007 146 people in the waiting list, while on the last year we even had a little bit more of people, no? And the same number of children, those are the children. So it means that our waiting list is very stable and we are able to transplant all the people that are in the waiting list and to renew them uh, all the time. So why? Why this is like this? Basically, those are the keys of our success. And I might highlight uh, these three main points. First, that we have professionalized the activity. So that means that in every hospital, there is someone responsible of donation. More about disease donation, but it also includes living donation in where this person is the advocate of the living donor. That means that we need a continuous training of the professionals. Uh, and that's important because it means that um, these people need to be always, always getting new information and between them to exchange the knowledge and the new practices. And by doing that, we have been able to change the culture inside the hospital. So that's uh, really important. Um, in Spain, Everybody uh, working in the hospital knows that part of the mission of the hospital is also to take care of the deceased person, of the people who died. Because after death, there is the possibility of using these organs for transplantation. So that's also a very important point to, to take into, into consideration. Of course, uh, it goes together with having a quality plan in where we measure the activity we do, we analyze it and we see how to improve it. We have the institutional support. That's also a very important point from the government, but also from the hospital. We have a favorable uh, legal framework. That's also uh, really important to make sure that this activity uh, is under the legal framework. The inter-hospital network in where all the hospitals are, are connected and we have a national organization that makes sure that the organs are properly allocated to one center to the other one, that the donor from one side can be assessed, the organs can be used in other centers, etc. Information management is about 
how to control the information that comes up from the mass media. And this is something that is also done by the national competent authority. And finally, what I was telling you before, the fact of having people professionalized on this makes that we are always able to innovate and to go further on on how to expand the donor source. So when we want to implement a transplant system, including the disease donation, we need to have three main levels uh, covered with that. So we have the national authority, uh, which depends from the Ministry of Health. Then we have a level in where we have the hospitals and the healthcare professionals, and the, the, the population is the other uh, level that we need to take into consideration. Each of these levels needs to have different responsibilities and roles. So the national authority is in charge of the legal and regulation framework to take care also on the quality. The financial resources should be also uh, organized or at least um, or oriented by these national competent authority, as well as the waiting list, the allocation system and the registries. So these this um, level is really important because it gives trust to the society. So it is not a hospital that is dealing with that. It is the national competent authority. It's the Ministry of Health. And all these data should be as transparent as, as possible to make sure that the population is um, really following that and they 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 are going to trust on, on the system. For me, the most important part is this red one, is the hospitals and the health care professionals, because they are the ones that by changing their mission and their vision will become the, the, the main players of the activity. So if you have a population that wants to donate, but the hospitals are not ready and the professionals are not ready, nothing's going to happen. So unfortunately, many times when a country wants to put uh, in place a disease donation program, the first thing they think is we need to we need to do awareness uh, with the population. But the first ones that have to be ready are these level of hospitals and healthcare, because they are the ones that are going to run the clinical procedures. So they need to have clear SOPs, protocols, guidelines. They need to do some research and education too. And the scientific societies can be very helpful at this level. And of course, the population is really important because they are, in fact, the ones that are the beneficiaries of the activity, but they are also the potential donors. So we really need the population to trust on the system and to follow the system and to understand that this is a new activity for the for the country. But if we start too early with the population while the system is not ready, this might cause some misunderstandings. So um, we believe that the population themselves, the transplanted people, the recipients, are the best people to do awareness among the population. And of course, we need to have on board the leaders, the religious leaders, the cultural leaders, and the mass media and the information management to make sure that this level of the system is well assessed, is well uh, informed about what we are going to do, and that the right information will go to them. But of course, this is not really a pyramid. We should work in parallel. And this, the only way to make this working is by creating committees that are organized by the National Competent Authority to create task forces in between the professionals, the authorities, some patients, and the same to reach consensus with all the elements of uh, of the system. The way how it is organized is quite different. Now nowadays in most of the countries that have just started with uh, leaving transplantation, usually the transplant teams and mainly the nephrologists are the ones that are highly interested in starting disease donation. And that's why the transplant teams sometimes are the ones that starts these uh, disease donation activity. But of course, this cannot remain on time because uh, the, 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 the responsibilities have to be shared, have to be clear, and the transplantees need to take care of the recipients while other people need to take care of the potential donors. In the United States, they have externalized this activity of disease donation in what they call organ procurement organizations, 
those organizations take care of a big service area that can be a state or can not coincide with a state. You can have in one state more than one OPO. But what it's clear is that this independent organization that is in most of the cases non-for-profit, they will give the service of organ donation to different hospitals. So when in a hospital, an ICU doctor identifies a potential donor, they will call this organization and this organization will take care of everything. Uh, even sometimes the donor is transferred to this OPO and all the man the management of, of the maintenance of the organs, the retrieval and so will be done in this OPO. In Spain, um, we don't have the resources to do that because this means to create a, a, a whole new uh, institution, organization. So what we decided to do is to create inside the hospital an organ donation unit with what we call transplant procurement managers who are doctors in charge of this activity. And this do donation unit is totally independent from the transplant teams and depends usually directly from the medical director of the hospital. So as I was mentioning before, it is a totally new activity that is integrated inside the hospitals. So that means that the vision of the hospital has to change, as I said before, and they need to incorporate disease donation as part of their services. And the health professional's mission also has to change, and they need also to incorporate the death as part of their work and to refer dead people that could become organ or tissue donors. Who are the people in charge of this activity? Well, mainly they are ICU doctors working uh, in the hospital. They can work full-time or part-time. So the responsible of the activity is always a doctor and uh, mainly someone from the ICU. But also they can, um, they can create a team that, of course, will include also nurses coming uh, basically from the ICU. Why the ICU uh, or the emergency or anesthesia? Because it is there in where you will have the potential donors. It is there in where you will have intubated patients that, um, that might evolve to brain death or uh, to do a withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment to become potential donors. And this is the figure of the transplant procurement management or key donation person that, as you can see here, is a medical specialist in ICU with the support of, of um, nurses. It can be one single professional or a team of professional working on that. They have a full-time dedication or part-time and they depend on the hospital medical direction. And their, their objectives of, of, of the people working on that is to detect all possible disease donors in the hospital, to guarantee the procurement of the highest number of organs and tissues, but not only the number, also the quality, and to promote donation and transplantation inside the hospital and outside the hospital. And finally, very important, to do the evaluation of these activity by themselves. So it is this intra-hospital organ donation unit can be a pluridisciplinary or multidisciplinary uh, team. Uh, you can have doctors, nurses, but also you need administratives, researchers, medical students, biologists, so as any other unit in the hospital. And the functions, as I said before, will be not only the clinical procedures, but also to do research, education, quality assessment, and the management. So if we go through the different donors that we can have, we have the living donors. Uh, it can be for kidney and liver, basically. It can also be for tissues, if we consider the blood, for instance, and the cells. Then we have the brain death patients, people that um, have a permanent loss of the functions of the brain, which is not a coma, it's a brain death situation. So it is irreversible and it's permanent. And these people who are considered dead, who are certified as a dead person, but which organs still functioning because the heart is still beating, these people can become organ tissue and cell donors. Then 
when there is a cardiac arrest that can be because there is a an, an unfruitful uh, see, um, resuscitation or because we have done a withdrawal of life sustaining treatment these patients can also uh, become uh, organ and tissue uh, donors but any person who dies in the hospital and who has no blood circulation can become tissue and cell uh, donor. So the clinical donation process in disease donation uh, has uh, mainly these uh, parts. So first of all, the donor detection. This detection can be done inside or outside the ICU or even outside the hospital in case of some um, cardiac arrest for DCD type 2. Then we have to evaluate the donor as a whole and then organ by organ. So in here, uh, we need to know which are the absolute contraindications. We need to have the possibility to do some um, ancillary tests to make sure that we are assessing properly the functionality of the organs that can be transplanted. Then comes the death diagnosis that has to be done by an independent team from the donation and the transplantation team. During all this time in the ICU, the people from the ICU needs to have clear protocols on how to maintain the functionality of the organs, not the patient anymore because there is no patient, but of the organs. Then we also need, and this is a clinical uh, step to obtain the consent. So we need to give proper information to the family and we need to let them understand what is the procedure and if, if they are able to, um, to, to, to continue and if they, they, they want to, to continue with that. And then uh, sometimes we also need the legal authorization in case of violent, violent death or uh, non-clinical certificate of death. Another important point is the organ allocation that, as I said before, should be managed by the National Competent Authority. And then the transplant teams should do the organ retrieval and finally the transplantation. The first part, the donor detection, is really important because finally, from all the deaths of a, don of a, of a hospital, only around 4% of all the deaths of the hospital could become brain death. If we look at the ICU death, we're talking also about maximum 15% of I all ICU death might progress to brain death, but only 50% of those deaths will become a donor. So that's why it is so important to have a very proactive way on uh, detecting potential donors on the hospital. And this, the only way to do it is to have people dedicated on this activity. And uh, I'm always talking about quality because I believe that the only way to make sure we can uh, go further, we can improve what we are doing is by calculating, by measuring what we are doing. And here it's really interesting because these indicators on donation comes from the Spanish Society of Intensive Care Medicine. So it means that the intensive care doctors have understood that to measure their performances, they also need to measure what they are doing in donation. So the integration by the ICU staff uh, about the, the this donation process is really, really important. So when we want to implement uh, a disease donation program, it is really important to train professionals, both in the donation and in the transplantation uh, part. We need to get or to ensure the institutional support, hospital, but also national. We need to make sure we have a legal and an ethical framework in where this activity can uh, be really protected and, 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 and safe. And, and then, of course, we need to have a, a, a program that is self-sustainable, that we don't need people from outside to do this work, but that the country, the hospital is able to perform this activity alone. And of course, if we want to start, we have to start with very successful first cases, not to lose the confidence and the trust, not only from the population, but by the other professionals in the hospital um, too. So how to start? 
uh, if you don't have anything, kidney leaving transplantation might be a good option. But parallelly, we should uh, study the viability, uh, as I told you, the legal framework, the cost, uh, what will be the reimbursement policy, the institutional support. So this is very important to be done. Meanwhile, you are doing the kidney leaving transplantation, you are starting to do that. And then you can start uh, working on disease donation and transplant programs. But I think it's really important when you start disease donation program, not to forget the tissues because those, and, and also what I believe it's really important too is donors after cardiac death because those are another source of organs that can be interesting. So why uh, I am talking about that. So in my introduction, uh, it was already mentioned, but in Spain, we started having a successful model. That's why in 1991, in my hospital, hospital clinic, we were asked by the national um, the national organization to set a course to homogenize the practices all around Spain. This is how it started. Then from the hospital, we moved to the university because very fast in 94, we started uh, doing training also to other countries. And we started doing the courses, not only in Spain, but also in, um, in, in English. And we had to adapt uh, the contents to the different realities in the world. So what works in Spain doesn't need uh, to work uh, in, in other countries. Uh, but then the, the point was that uh, this was done under the University of Barcelona um, uh, umbrella. But uh, with the time, many of the people trained when they wanted to implement other things and, to, and they were asking us to help them in situ with uh, the creation of SOPs, helping them uh, uh, there in their hospitals. We couldn't do it under the umbrella of the University of Barcelona. And that's why in 2010, we created the DTI Foundation, with, which is a non-for-profit foundation, uh, non-governmental, which aim is and which mission is to advise, train and support professionals uh, worldwide, uh, hospitals and and and. And, and countries on the development of, of these kind of projects. And how do we do it? Well, basically by training, but also with more specific projects in where we can call them cooperation projects and uh, also registries uh, that um, can help on the transparency of the of the project. So the after 30 years of experience, you can imagine that we have many kinds of trainings and uh, different levels of trainings that comes from elementary training to master level uh, with the University of Barcelona. So we still uh, are, of course, under the umbrella of the uni with the uh, of the university for 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 most of the trainings. And then the modalities also of training have been um, changing and, and and we are now doing any kind of, of that. So as you can see here, we have courses uh, about organ procurement, about disease donation since 91. We have the master since 94. And we also have trainings about tissue banking since 2005. And in, since 1991, we have trained almost 19,000 people from more than 100 countries. And this is really important because it gives you, it's not only about training people, it's about learning from these people and their situation. And we have been learning a lot. And our experts, so the DTI, do not um, only... Um, counts on the Spanish experience, but on the best models or the most successful experiences in the world. So we have experts from all over the world, people who have put in place uh, successful disease donation programs. In tissue banking also, we have trained uh, 60, 650 participants from 71 countries. And well, here you have some uh, examples that the more people you train the more donors you have. So this is uh, the Spanish situation, but not only that, Italy, Portugal, Slovenia, and Croatia, their ministries of health have asked DTI to train all their ICU doctors on the field. And you can see that those are very successful programs. And uh, in fact, they are leading in, in Europe. But not only Europe, we have Thailand as another example on how donation um, can improve by, by having more and more people trained. 
Of course, this is not on the only factor. There are other factors, but if a country decides to train their people, means that they put in place also other um, other systems and other uh, activities. So here you can see Iran, the people we have trained all over the years and how they have moved from a, a system that was mainly leaving uh, transplantation to a model that now comes before Germany, for instance. And in China uh, also, no? in China, they, they started the disease donation with the international standards uh, since 2010, and you can see the evolution, and we have been working uh, very intensively with them. And this is one of our last projects with the Emirates and the same, no, it was really stable. And he, when we started not only training people, but also working with them on site, they have been able to reach four donors per million population. Some data about the master. I think it's important also to understand that if we, if you want to change the culture among the professionals, you need to put disease donation in the academic level too. So we have this program from the University of Barcelona with 60 European credits in where the, the all the students needs to do organ procurement and leadership quality and management. And then they can choose in between organ transplantation and tissue banking. And then they have an internship and finally a final master dissertation. These, the whole project can, the whole program can be done online. But if people want to do the internship, uh, of course, in a, in a country, they can, they can do it. And you can see that we have people from all the continents that have joined the master degree. Here you have some images on how during COVID we, 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 we moved from doing the face-to-face -face trainings to the online. And we have also developed some virtual reality uh, um, uh, experiences for family approach and also to do the internship or to at least visit a hospital and understand how this disease donation uh, system is is organized inside a Spanish um, hospital. And then, as I was mentioning before, we can go more deep on that and we can work on a more cooper uh, on, a, on a project in where we can help the professionals and the institutions to develop the system from inside. So we have um, different steps. We have to start understanding the situation through a diagnosis study, analyzing the, 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 the current situation. Then we can help on organizing the system inside the hospital. So the human resources, the, all the processes and the financial man management. We can help on also maximize this donor detection that as I was telling you before is the clue of not losing potential donors and so on. And well, here you have some examples of countries. We started with a region of Italy where there was a big, big difference in between this region and the rest of the country. Lebanon, I just put some that were in different places in the world, uh, Lebanon, uh, China, or the Caribbean like Trinidad and Tobago. But in, in, um, in Africa also, we started working together the University of Michigan with Ethiopia in where we started uh, evaluating the situation, helping on the development of the of the law, and uh, and well, unfortunately, because of their political situation, we we should stop. And also through the International Society of Nephrology, we have been uh, working with, in this case, is Philippines, but we also are working with Sri Lanka. And here you have uh, Sudan. In Sudan also, we started working with them, but unfortunately, as you know, this is, um, well, uh, now nowadays the situation is not uh, stable enough to, to continue and it's not the priority. So Emirates, uh, as I was mentioning before, and here you have some of the European projects uh, that as my, as, as the presenter just said before, we have been leading. Uh, it's not only about training, it's about developing the guidelines for tissues, for living donation, for quality, etc. 
This project was about training in Europe with different countries. This was a very interesting project for creating a post-degree program on donation and transplantation in two universities of Morocco, two of Egypt and two of Lebanon. Uh, then another one in China with seven universities in where we have also developed a Chinese post-degree program on organ donation. And here you have this other project that uh, is also interesting because it was not about post-degree, it was about training not only the professionals, but other stakeholders of the population of the that, that might be important. And the last post-degree program that we had was called Odyssea with Thailand, Myanmar, Philippines, and Malaysia. And well, uh, just to tell you that uh, this Spanish model and, and what we are, and, and, and basically to develop a disease donation program, it's not about knowledge and experience, but it's also about passion because you need really to put the effort and to, to go through that and, and it becomes a, a passion. And well, I'm more than happy to answer any of your questions or comment. Thank you so much. Dr. Delpia, thank you very much for the very inspiring and stimulating talk. Um, Dr. Swali, our chair, unfortunately had to leave. Yeah. So I'll be uh, helping uh, Dr. Lloyd uh, with the questions. Uh, but I must tell you, um, it is something that I think every country should be looking at. You know, your model is very, very interesting. Uh, if you don't mind, I will take the questions on the chat. But before I do that, you know, I'm a pediatrician at heart. So I just want to ask you something that is always irks me. How come we have such so few pediatric uh, donor, uh, eligible donors, com I mean, uh, recipients compared to your adults? I'm sure you have a much larger pediatric population than that. Yes. <clears throat> well, uh, the point is that um, usually for children... We have 66 children... compared to 4,000 something. Exactly. But it's about the kind of, of diseases that lead to uh, the need of transplantation. So right. for, for the adults, usually is chronic diseases that lead to that. And for children, usually is more congenital problems yeah. and, and it's uh, fewer incidents. So that might be the, the answer. I wanted to bring up that statement because I just want to tell you, pediatricians are getting very good. We are able to grow our children. To uh, exactly. and, <laughs> and of course, this is also about that. This is also Sorry. about that. <laughs> that was just something I wanted to present. But anyway, thank you so much. Let's take some uh, 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 questions from the chat. Uh, the, the first one, I think, let's see. Let's go up to the top. The Gimonga said, thanks very much for this narrative presentation. Regards to the topic, do you have any data about donors in Africa? What is the situation in Africa, especially in East Africa, regarding training and on donation in East Africa? Well, uh, basically in East Africa, <laughs> uh, there is no disease donation. There is transplantation uh, activity. And uh, yes, there are some data that I that I've showed in the global observatory and in IRODAT that they are showing, but it's only only living donation. So there is no country in this moment doing disease donation. The only country, as I said, in uh, in Africa is South Africa, and um, and some uh, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, and uh, yeah, Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria. Has Egypt done in? Egypt do not have disease donation till now. So just to carry on with his, he made a point also to say, I also agree about the society uh, lacking on proper information on donations issue, which is causing them to have false beliefs. We need to work to improve awareness towards positive attitudes towards donation. And I think that's a very important statement, you know. Absolutely. Hmm. Cultural and, and religious beliefs are something... Uh, we need to work towards absolutely and and of course every culture has its own uh, its its own um, circumstances and beliefs and so on but the first ones that have to change their attitudes and uh, and knowledge are the professionals are the, the the healthcare professionals if you focus on the healthcare professionals and these um, this community really understands how donation has to work, how it works, how what is brain death, 
how the donation process is, is done, then they, since they are the mo they are the, the key persons for the population for any health care uh, situation, these will be naturally go for yes. the population. But the point is that many times we blame the population thinking that they are not ready, that the religion do not allow, blah, blah, blah. But in fact, the ones that we have to blame is ourselves first and to see how we can change our minds. Do all our colleagues understand what brain death is? Do all our colleagues understand how disease donation works? If this don't, doesn't work, nothing will happen with the population. So what you're saying in effect is we need champions for transplant. People who can go out into the community and actually sensitize the community towards organ donation. Am exactly, right? exactly. <clears throat> but first, I would say, let's work on the organization. Let's work yeah. on the professional side. Once everything is set, it's, it will come quite, quite uh, naturally. And the best ambassadors will be the patients who have received an organ. Because this is what moves the people more than seeing a doctor from transplantation talking about the good results. Of course, good results will also be very important to tell every year, this year, this country, we have been able to do so many transplants, we have saved those lives. Mm. Those are the kind of, of, of messages that will really change the mind of the people, not things about, you know, and, and then putting also, we have to count on the leaders of the communities to put them on board, to explain them very clear how the things are going to work and they will be also very good ambassadors. We've run a few of those workshops in South Africa, and uh, I can't give you a measure of how good the output was, but I have to tell you that uh, our organ donation has slightly in improved in, in my province based mm. on those workshops. See? Absolutely. Um, yeah. And the more, the more transparent you yeah. are, the better it will be because you need the trust. In fact, it's a matter of trust, of trusting on the system that if I give the organs of my son, these organs will benefit the population. These organs will not benefit economically anyone. Everything will be transparent, et cetera, et cetera. To altruism. Yeah. Mm. Exactly. Uh, Dr. Jimonga, I hope uh, that answers your question. Uh, then we have a question from uh, Dr. Kijuru Kilonzo. Uh, Spain is a great example of success. Thank you for sharing. Yes, passion pays a lot. And he said that's quite an inspiring uh, mm -hmm. talk. Thank you. Oh. Uh, that was just a comment. Uh, so uh, Dr. Yoga asked, is the heart from a dead donor declared via the cardiorespiratory criteria uh, being donated? <clears throat> yes, yes, uh, but for a very special uh, kind. So uh, what we call donors after cardiac death, they are mainly two, 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 two kinds. One is the person who has a cardiac arrest. So the main problem would come from the heart and um, through some kind, I mean, maintaining uh, the, the um, artificially the, the circulation, we are able to recuperate uh, all the abdominal organs and the lungs, but of course not the heart because uh, the heart usually is the one uh, that caused the death of the person. But on the other kind of donors after cardiac death, it is uh, what we call, we call expected disease donation, uh, expect donors, um, DCD donors or controlled DCD donors. Those are people with a very bad prognosis in where the, 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 the doctors in charge decide to do a withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment and uh, the family agrees on donating the organ. So when we stop the, the treatment of this patient and we uh, stop the ventilation, we wait for five minutes without circulation and then we restore artificially the circulation of all the body except of the, 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 um, the, 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 the brain, of course, because the person is dead and we don't want to restore the circulation. In this case, the heart... Are, are are used 
in case that they are young, et cetera, et cetera. And the results are extraordinary. In Spain, from what I understand, you have an opt-out system, right? Everyone is a donor until unless there's some uh, major objection to them being that. Right? That's a very good point. So um, theoretically, there there is the opting in and the opting out. In the opting out, we what it is stated by the law is that everybody is a donor. This, I mean, only in case they object or the family objects, then they are they don't become a donor. And the opt-in in where you have to really state that you want to become a donor. What happens in Spain is that we have the opt-out system, but it is what we call a soft opt-out because we don't have a registry for people not wanting to become a donor. And why so? Because first of all, if you have a registry of non-donors, you have to to do some publicity of that because you need the people to know about it. And this is not the idea to tell the people, hey, guys, if you don't want to become a donor, just register. But second and most important is by, because we, the professionals working on that, we want to talk with every single family. In Spain, our society is really organized in family and doing something against the family will would be a big mistake. So what we really do is even is even more strict than in opting in. Because even if we know that someone wanted to become a donor, we will talk to the family. And if finally the, fan the family do not agree, even knowing that the person wanted, we will not push. So it is really a very soft uh, opting out system. So there is very few countries doing the hard opting out in the, in the world. Uh, how can we do get assistance in establishing disease donation in Tanzania? <laughs> well, uh, in fact, there are some nephrologists from Tanzania that have already reached uh, uh, us. I think that what is important is that if you are interested on that and you want, you just contact me and we start talking and we see how to do it. And And the important thing is that I know that in Tanzania, now uh, they are creating a national competent authority. They are putting in place some regulations and legal framework. So from that on, we can discuss on how to do it. And I think we need, of course, the support of the of the Ministry of Health and of the hospitals that want to be involved. And from that, we, we start. And if we need some funding, extra, whatever, we will find it together. So that's mm. the idea. Yeah, no, that's 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 good. But obviously, you need the political will as well to, to promote. That. Exactly. What, what makes no sense? <clears throat> this is not a. Sometimes they ask me, this is a bottom up or or yes. a, or a top down. Mm. In fact, it it has to be from both directions. And if it could say from east to west and from west to east also, <laughs> because it's really a kind of 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 uh, holistic activity. Okay. Yeah. That needs all. Great. Okay, um, Dr. Ingemba said, did the 2008 uh, economic crisis affect the transplant program in your country? And what are suggestions when the resources are limited? <laughs> very, very good question. Uh, of course, uh, economical crisis affects because it affects the healthcare system. And if, for instance, you have less ICU doctors or if you have less ICU beds available, these will will have a direct impact on the potential donors you have in a in a hospital. The point is that if you already have a mature system, you can deal with that. You can try to find ways. The problem of the budget is really important because um, for everybody, it is clear that if you want to do transplantation, you need to have surgeons that are trained. You need to have nephrologists that are trained. You need to have uh, ORs in where to do it. But sometimes the hospital, the, 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 the countries forget that if you want to do that, you also need to work on the donation side. And in the donation side, you also need to train doctors. You also need to have ICU beds available. And you need to pay these people that are working on this, on this uh, field. And if they are doing extra hours or if they are working on that full time, they need to, to, to be paid. So it is important to make the authorities understand that transplantation imply i mean inside transplantation there should be also a budget uh, specific for for donation yeah resource allocation is very important <clears throat> so hmm, 
Dr. Lloyd asks a very interesting question, which I suppose to ask. Do children get an allocation preference? <laughs> yes, they do. In Spain, they are the priority. So uh, any person uh, under 40 kilos or any child, of course, <clears throat> will go directly for children. So that's why now our waiting list in, in our region, in Catalonia, in Barcelona area, we almost have no children in the waiting list. Children are waiting one month, um, two months yeah. for kidney, uh, for liver. It comes because we are doing split from adults to children. So any liver, uh, we can split it and put one part for a child and the other one for a small adult. So really children have become for Spain, the priority but this is a totally arbitrary thing uh, and there are other countries that do not do that I, is there any country that doesn't give preference to children i'm just yeah asking. yeah there, there there are many uh, in mm -hmm. many allocation systems children just need to have the the specific matching a child for a child or and, and they don't go for for them oh. even in europe mm. Mm. do you have any further questions for uh, there are more here. Uh, what about adult donors who have a low GFR? Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you take uh, both kidneys no, no, to I one individual? I was asking you if you had anything for that. <clears throat> what do you mean? Uh, uh, for for Loy, you mean? Yeah, I, I, no, I thought he had any more questions. Uh, the, 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 about donors, uh, adult donors, how do, you, how do you decide if an elderly donor is uh, fit to donate and sends a cadaveric donor? The organ is fit to be transplanted or not, uh, especially okay. when the GFR could be low. Yes. So first of all, a very important point is that uh, our our donors in Spain are getting older and older. So we have a lot of experience on that. And what we have seen is that those elderly kidneys work very well for elderly recipients. So old for old is our policy of allocation for kidneys. And if the kidneys uh, have a normal function, even normal function for the age of the patient, and there has not been a decrease, or if there was a decrease on the functionality, uh, there has been uh, uh, a recuperation of, of this functionality during the time in the ICU. For us, those kidneys can work for an old recipient. So we are going to take into consideration the creatinine. I mean, all the parameters that have to do, we can do echographies, we can do biopsies also. Uh, and in case we really don't, we are not sure about it, we always have the possibility to put them in a ex situ perfusion machine to do the final assessment on, on their functionality. There's an interesting you. question from Dr. Shilpa Moki. He said, I work at the eye hospital with a cornea bank. Traditionally speaking, lots of beliefs that one must be buried with as much of the body uh, intact as possible. Cornea's are included. But yes, uh, we need to create awareness focus uh, on religious leaders while the docs start to encourage end, organ, uh, end stage patients regarding donation. So when it comes to um, other organs besides the kidney and the liver, etc., you are using uh, tissue donation from deceased donors, right? Yeah. So any person that dies in the hospital uh, and if there is not a contra, an absolute contraindication, so for corneas, uh, not even cancer is a contraindication because cornea is an avascular tissue, so the risk is very, very low. Only those hematological cancers are an absolute contraindication. So let's say that most of the people who dies in the hospital might be potential cornea donors. When we talk with these families, so for talking about organ donation with families, it's uh, more easy for them to understand because we all believe and understand that you are saving the life of someone. But when it comes to tissues, when you talk about cornea, about skin, about bones, about vo valves, about, you know, it really, it's a little bit gore and, and it can make the people get afraid about that. But then you have to talk about 
what does it represent for someone? So instead of getting an amputation, you can restore part of the bone. Instead of being blind, you can recover your 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 uh, vision. So I think that this is the way how to talk with them. And then a very important thing is to ensure the family that the body will be restored and will be carefully restored. So all the times when we do a cornea or even the whole uh, um, ocular globe uh, retrieval, we will put a prosthesis that will uh, ensure that the volume will be there and then we close the eye and nobody can see the difference. So if you don't say it, uh, nobody will notice. Okay, so you have to close the eye and the same for all the other tissues. So I think that the only way to make the people understand is to talk about the use, the final benefit of doing that for the people that will receive the tissues. Thanks. Um, I got a notice from Dr. Matthew that Prof. Kajiri is on, on the call from Tanzania. So he's one of the senior nephrologists. Prof. Kajiri, do you want to make a comment? Can organ recipients become organ donors later when they die? <laughs> well, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Um, in fact, they could. Of course, they could. The point is that all the stars have to be aligned for that because <laughs> the kind of, of, of death you have should be compatible with donation. But of course, there is no uh, contraindication for that. Yeah, <laughs> it's a very interesting question because I mean, we had one case uh, where a person who was transplanted actually demised, and the family said, "Well, we could use that organ." Unfortunately, um, someone objected to it, so we couldn't really use that. <laughs> but it's interesting that that you can do that. You understand? Know I mean? mm. Um, some of these are, are just comments, and most people are thanking you for this wonderful presentation. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else on the panel has any questions for Dr. Delpia. Uh, there are some questions in the Q&A box. Two, there, two questions. Question in the Q &A. Okay, let me just check that. Uh, oh, Dr. Dr. Nunda, in, in, the development, in the developing of organ donation from the deceased person, what mechanisms are you putting in place to stay on course with East African Kidney Institute in, in matters of training, sponsorship and the like. So if I understand, it's it's about if there's any activity, no, to try to develop disease donation. Well, the, the point is that, as Specific I've mentioned, African, yeah, exactly. So I, I think that specifically for Africa, I think that there is a, a big, uh, it's, it's quite recent, always apart South Africa. It is quite recent that uh, many countries are oh. now starting to be interested on that. In fact, I am a member of the African uh, Nephrology Society because we are trying to work through the nephrologist uh, on how to, to, to well, to, to give an answer to this need, you know, because more and more African people were going abroad to be transplanted. So this is also a concern for the WHO. So we are working also with the WHO. And I think that uh, it, it is starting. It is a starting point. And uh, if anyone has any idea, any possibility, we are more than open. And we are trying to put all the stakeholders together to try to, to give you support on that. Great. So I think they, can they contact you on by email? Absolutely, or absolutely. Okay. You can well, contact me. And in fact, yeah. I have seen that someone was asking for my slides. I will share it with you through PDF okay. and yeah. you can use them. Uh, sure. Dr. Yeah, I'll send it to the whole group. If I get the PDF, I'll send it to the whole group. Oh, okay. And you have the video. Excellent. So that's good. Two more questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Job uh, Kasueshi. As do you encourage transplanting children? I was discussing with my boss today the need to start this. I mean, transplanting children should be a must, I guess. Exactly, <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, and, the and <laughs> that, that's the point. And, and even for kidney, I mean, if we could avoid those childs to be under dialysis and even to do preemptive kidney transplantation uh, i believe that this is the best the the, the best practice and I mean, that's why and there's I, a preference. preferentially they're given higher points uh, exactly 
even in South Africa, I mean, we give them extra points. Yeah, yeah, we should. <clears throat> Dr. Del Pietro, thank you very much uh, for this wonderful presentation. I think it's it was a source of inspiration for every one of us, particularly in Africa, where transplantation really needs to you know take off. You know what I mean? Look, in South Africa, I must say we've got it pretty much established, but uh, we can still do better. And it's really inspiring. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm just going to ask uh, Dr. Lloyd if he has anything else to add before we close. Uh, I think, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Chloe. It was a wonderful session. Uh, uh, it's remarkable the amount of work you've been doing across the globe. Uh, and uh, knowing the details in every country, uh, which is on the you know on your map, it's phenomenal. And I think uh, the passion is there. And... Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think that is like inbuilt uh, genetically in the Spanish community. Yes. <laughs> it's phenomenal. <laughs> I, I must Thank say, you. I one thing on Thank your you map. very, very much Africa, for this. Every it's, African it's country very... is missing. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. But thank you very much. Uh, thank really you very, very much. Thank you, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you to all of you. Yeah. I, if, okay. if it was inspiring, uh, we reached the goal, and uh, yeah. and I'm more than happy to to share anything with oh, you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So, so I would Bye. love the slides if on an email, a PDF of the slides. I, I will share it across with everybody. I will do it now. Uh, yeah, I've got a few emails. Yeah, sure. Okay. And, and yeah, we'll reach out okay. as well. There are a number of centers which actually would like to do something. So I don't know how can be done. Uh, probably. I'll tell them to reach out and, Absolutely. and we will also be able to assist. They will be able to assist as well. So exactly. And and with my presentation, there is my email. So please do not yeah. hesitate to contact and, and we will do our best to to find out how to, to how yeah. to help. So thank you so much and have thank a nice so evening. Thank you. Thank Dr. you so much. Bye.